It's always a pleasure for me when I get to introduce one of my professors uh, from, from Dallas Theological Seminary, but even more so it's a privilege that I get to introduce one of my friends, uh, Dr. Timothy Yoder. I would butcher his title if I just tried to say it, but he is an associate professor of theology at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he's in charge of the evangelism and apologetics department there as well. He's the resident philosopher at Dallas Theological Seminary and, and just a, an incredible person. Uh, if you've ever spoken to Dr. Yoder, he is one of the most welcoming uh, people and one of the most easiest people to speak with, most easiest. That's how easy it is to speak to Dr. Yoder. He, he won't grade me on that, hopefully. Uh, but anyway, without, uh, without me saying much more, uh, I'll invite Dr. Yoder to come up and speak to us this morning. To here or in the center? Uh, right the center? in the middle, yeah. All right, very good. <clears throat> well, good morning, and thank you to Raleigh uh, for inviting me to, to share the word with you this morning. It's a privilege and an honor to be here and uh, to, to worship among you. I live in Mesquite, not that far away, and uh, it's great to come up here and be with you and to share in the joy of our fellowship together. What I want to talk about today um, is a pretty simple word. It's the word grace. And in fact, let's go to the... There we go. So if, if somebody asks you, what was the sermon about today? You just have to remember one word, grace. And that's easy. Um, grace is something that we talk about. In fact, one of my, my questions is, is, to, is to ask you, what comes to mind when you hear the word grace? What, 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 what mental images do you get? It's a, it's a word that's used actually a lot in church contexts and in non-church contexts. Maybe you think of saying grace before a meal. Uh, maybe you think of an athlete who displays grace as they run or jump or skate or ski or whatever. Uh, the royals are frequently called your grace, right? There are musical grace notes for those of you that understand music. Um, as a professor, I get sometimes asked to provide a grace period, right, for students who are late on their tests. Um, the government allows us a grace period sometimes for our bills and things like that. Um, even, um, even, it even shows up in some words for thank you in different languages. Gracias in Spanish. Merci in French, right? These are all... So this is a, a very interesting and flexible, and really it's a beautiful word. Um, uh, Max Lucado said, grace is God's best idea. Um, and it, it's because uh, so much of God's plan and purpose for us as people, um, is, is bound up in the word grace. Um, <clears throat> Bono from U2 says that, uh, he, sings, he sings a song called Grace, and in that he says that while grace could be the name for a girl, it's also a thought that changes the world. And I think he's right. It absolutely, he absolutely describes what grace does. She takes the blame, she covers the shame, removes the stain. Grace is one of our most beautiful words, and I want to explore that with you this morning. So, so what is grace? Some people say, as you can see on the screen, that grace is getting what we don't deserve, like a gift, whereas mercy is not getting what we do deserve, like punishment. I think that's, I think that's fair, although I, um, I think that, that for the most part, grace and mercy are, are synonyms. I like this definition. Um, grace is God's unexpected and unmerited favor and love. And, uh, and this is what I want to reflect on. Um, we often think of grace in the context of forgiveness, right? To be forgiven is to, is to receive God's grace, and that's true, and we're going to focus on, on those things. But it's important, I think, to note that, that grace extends beyond just forgiveness and salvation. Grace is, often, is also found in God's lavish gift of creation. We are made in His image. Uh, we, he breathed His life into us. 
He created the world with beauty and, and, uh, and wonder and awe in it. When we sit at the beach or when we climb a mountain or wherever we happen to be, we are experiencing God's grace. All these, all these are examples of the extravagant, wonderful act of grace that God gave for us. Um, in Romans chapter 11, Paul says, and if, it was, and if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Grace is is not by works. That's why it's the unexpected and unmerited. It, it's, not, it's not what comes to us because of what we earn. It's something extra. It's a bonus. It's a gift. It's something that we didn't uh, deserve. And then in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace, through faith, we are saved. Not of works. It's a gift. Grace is something unexpected. I want to, this has all been kind of abstract, and so I wanted to try to make it a little bit more tangible. Tell you a story. Um, I love to tell stories. Um, some of, most of you perhaps are familiar with the person John Newton. And if you're not familiar with him, you are probably familiar with his most famous hymn, Amazing Grace. Um, and, uh, and, and it's very apt that John Newton would write this hymn because he was a person who experienced grace. Let me tell you a little bit about his life story. It's quite, it's quite fascinating and tragic in many ways. Um, he was born in London in 1725. His mother died when he was a young boy. His father was a sea captain, and so young John went to sea. And in the 18th century, life on the seas was pretty rough. It was not pleasant. He was, he was beaten and treated poorly. He became rebellious and reckless um, and arrogant. And, um, and so he, uh, he earned a lot of the abuse that he received, but he also um, received a lot of uh, abuse that he didn't deserve. When he was 18, he was forcibly drafted into the British Navy. He tried to desert, um, but he was captured and he was lashed eight, eight, dozen time, eight dozen times. He was put ashore in West Africa um, because he tried to escape, where ironically he was sold into slavery to an African princess and severely mistreated. Eventually he was rescued and returned home uh, by, by boat to, uh, to England by a friend of his father, and during that voyage home, their ship was caught in a terrible storm um, and gouged with holes, and they would have sunk except miraculously some cargo shifted and covered a hole, and they managed to make it back to London safely. And it's at that point that Newton started to realize that, that there was something bigger and more important in his life, that there was some, that God was working to bestow him some grace. He was started to become a bit more spiritually awakened. But it was a long process. Um, he continued to, to go to sea, and he began to, to um, uh, work in the slave trade um, and to transport slaves from Africa to uh, the New World. And, um, and even though he, um, he began to be moved by the Spirit towards a Christian faith, uh, he continued in the slave trade for some time. Eventually, at age 29, pretty young, he had a stroke because of the difficulties of his life and, and had to give up this, his seafaring ways. And while he was home and not at sea, he began to be impacted by the ministry of John Wesley and others, and gradually over time, he completely renounced his slave trading ways and became a preacher and a hymn writer and, a, and an important leader of the church. And it's at that point that he wrote Amazing Grace when he was 47 years old. Um, and eventually um, uh, wrote a long overdue statement renouncing the evils of the slave trade uh, towards the end of his life. A, man, a, a copy of that letter was sent to every member of parliament and the slave trade was abolished in England a couple months before he died. So a man who spent his, the first half of his life in... Uh, terrible evil and uh, doing awful things was changed by God. And he spent the second half of his life as a minister of the gospel, as a testimony to the grace. So when he writes that he was a wretch, it's true. But God saved him and changed him through his grace. The unlimited, amazing grace of God worked in him to change his life. 
Grace is God's limitless love, which leads to opportunity after opportunity to turn the mess of our lives into something good. Um, I want to introduce to you a word that you may know, you may not. This is one of the most important Hebrew words in the Old Testament. It's the word hesed. It's also a very difficult and complicated word. Um, in your Bibles, it's oftentimes translated by any number of terms, sometimes loving kindness, sometimes covenantal love, sometimes faithfulness, graciousness. Um, it's a complicated word. It, it, it refers both to emotions our God, as He has compassion and love on us, and also to God's activity, to be, to be, to be, uh, to be loyal and to be loving and to be forgiving. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, I want to read a, two passages, actually, from Exodus. The first is, is, is in Exodus 20, and, um, and the other one in Exodus 34. Exodus 20 is one of the places where the Ten Commandments are given, and in verse 6, it says, um, after, after the commandment about not making any idols, it says, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. Showing love is the, is the Hebrew word chesed. God is showing love to a thousand generations of people. And then in Exodus 34, one of the powerful texts in the Old Testament on the nature of God, Yahweh reveals Himself to Moses um, when He made the new stone te uh, tablets that have the law, the Decalogue. And He says in verse 6, And He, the Lord, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Right? The word hesed is actually used twice there. First, in abounding in love and also in maintaining love. Right? The hesed of God uh, is, is a powerful and important component of who God is. Hesed is when a person from you have no right to expect anything and they give you it all. Right? Um, we have no right to expect anything from God. We have sinned and rebelled against Him. We have um, desecrated His name. We have broken His law. We have sinned hundreds, thousands of times. And yet, God in His mercy, in His love, in His hesed, has given us grace. Um, Paul says in Romans that when sin increases, grace increases all the more. And, and that's why I've called my sermon Unlimited Grace, because the grace of God is an inexhaustible supply of His, of His love, of His loyalty, of His compassion, of His mercy to forgive us of the things that we have done. What I would like to do to, to, to give a little more structure to what I'm doing is, 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 is explain for you uh, three truths about grace, three, three things about grace that are, that are true uh, that the Bible teaches us that we can use to think about this very important concept. And the first is that grace is God's domain. Grace is God's area. Grace is a, is a God thing, right? Grace is what God does. It's His work. The word grace appears in the New Testament 114 times, and every time it describes something that God does. In John chapter 1, it talks about uh, it says the law came from Moses, but grace and truth from Jesus, right? Jesus is full of grace and truth because Jesus is God and grace is God's um, domain. We approach the throne of grace in Hebrews uh, 4. That's God's throne. We are called by the God of all grace, according to 1 Peter 5. And in Ephesians, we can turn... I'll turn to that one. Ephesians chapter 1, in one of Paul's great prayers, he says um, at the beginning, <clears throat> his, he says, to the praise of His glorious grace, Ephesians 1, 6, in which He has freely given to us in the one that He loves, right? The glorious grace, and in, in, in verse 7, he talks about the riches of of His grace, right? This is God's work. This is God's domain. This is God's activity. Um, there are certain things that are God's, 
right? He is eternal. He is the creator. He is the alpha and the omega. He is omnipotent, omniscient. And one of the things that is his is grace. Um, Grace is in God, it's God's domain because it is the work of the supreme authority of the universe. Um, oops, let's go back. Not ready for that one yet. Um, uh, he is the supreme authority of the universe, the one who rightfully judges. Now, it might seem to you, and this is one of the interesting puzzles about grace, it might seem to you that grace and justice don't seem to go together very well. Justice is to punish somebody who did something wrong. And grace is to not punish someone. And it seems like they don't go together very well. And even more complicating is the fact that both of these characteristics are God's. God is the God of justice and God is the God of grace. So is God conflicted? Schizophrenic? How does this all work? Well, I could preach a whole sermon just on that particular issue, and I won't. But, but the short answer is that I think that... Um, uh, they, work, they work together. They work together. Some people think that grace is that God just waves his hand and all the wrong vanishes. That's not the story the New Testament tells. The story the New Testament tells is that Jesus takes on our sins, dies on the cross, purchases our atonement, and on the basis of that, God forgives. So um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when we talk about a, a pardon, that our sins are pardoned, in our American system, a pardon is is a governor or a president just lets a, a convicted criminal go. It's part of our system of checks and balances, but a lot of times it's, it's exploited by members of both parties to uh, serve some ag agendas. And it's, oftentimes it's not just. The person is just let go. But in the, in the New Testament, in our Christian theology, when God pardons our sins, he pardons it because Jesus paid the price. Remember, Grace is when we get something that we don't deserve and it's entirely unexpected. Right? We had a problem that we couldn't solve, sin. Unexpectedly, amazingly, Jesus died in our place so we could be forgiven. And, and it's all because of God's grace. Grace is, what is, is, is God's purpose and plan to offer a new situation for us. So, so justice is there, but grace goes beyond it. I don't think justice and grace are at odds, but grace exceeds what justice, justice is worried about, the rights and the wrongs. Jesus died for our sins, and then grace gives us these tremendous blessings on top of it. So the Father didn't ignore our sins or pretend they never happened. That would be justice and grace in conflict. Rather, God's unlimited grace was ready to swallow up all of our sins and make us holy. It's almost like grace is this giant black hole where, where the sins go to, um, and, and so that we can be uh, restored to a relationship with God. Now, another question that some of you might have is, I've said grace is God's domain, and it is, but, but don't we do grace ourselves, right? As a professor, I get asked by students for a little more time on the assignment. Can you give me some grace? Is that a wrong use of the word? Not really. Um, I think of it this way. Grace, capital G grace, is God's domain. And it's what God does. And we as humans, we are called to mirror what God does. Jesus said, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. We are supposed to try to imitate God. And so we can imitate this grace, little g grace, by, by extending mercy to others. And then we should. And this shows up in a very famous verse, Micah 6, 8, which is where we're going uh, in just a little bit. But let me talk, let me talk about the second truth here, um, which will perverse, prepare us for uh, an examination of Micah 6. So not only is grace God's domain, fundamentally his work, but grace is also never something that is earned or deserved or purchased. I've already hinted at this, but let's um, examine this a little bit more closely. Grace is something that is, all, that is tremendously costly to the giver and free to the one that receives it. Think about it, right? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Uh, Jesus endured the shame. Jesus, who knew no sin, received all of our sins. It was tremendously costly to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. 
but we receive it as a free gift. Grace has this interesting dynamic in that it is it can never be earned or bought or deserved. Um, if it is, it's not grace. If we, if we earn money and we receive our wages, okay, it's something that we work for. You can say thank you to the boss when he gives you the, your check. I mean, in the old days when you used to get checks, right? But, but you know, but you don't really, in a sense, you don't really have to because you've earned it. It's your money. You've earned it. It's part of the agreement. Or when you uh, get an award. Maybe you get an award for the highest GPA or for some achievement. You've earned it, and, they, and it's given to you. Um, or maybe you buy something. You, you purchase it, and it's yours. Those are all perfectly acceptable and meaningful transactions. But none of them are grace, because grace can never be earned. It can never be deserved. It can never be bought. It's never something that can be like that. It always exceeds our capacity. Let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> think with me, uh, back to your childhood perhaps, to one of the, to the, to the best Christmas presents that you ever received. Okay? Something that you never expected. Something that, that, that thrilled you beyond what you were expecting. I remember one instance like this in my life when I was a little boy, maybe about eight years old. Um, I lived with my parents in Pennsylvania. I have my sister, Anne. And, um, and one year, my parents decided that they would, they would make for my sister and I um, a, a, a present. It was a big deal. My mom made Anne a beautiful dress, and my dad made us a ping pong table. And um, it was really impressive. And, and not only did it was impressive that he made it, but he also somehow managed to fold it up and wrap it. It was under the tree. So I, I came down Christmas morning and, and um, unwrapping, and there's a famous Yoder family video, which I won't be showing you, of eight-year-old me unwrapping this ping-pong table. I have no idea what it is. I keep saying, what is it? What is it? What is it? And I'm trying to lift it up, and it's way too heavy for me. And it was a ping-pong table. And um, it, was, it was amazing, beyond what I ever expected. And certainly what I ever, whatever I could have done or, you know, earned, deserved, purchased as an eight-year-old. As I grew up, you know, maybe I could have gotten a job and earned money and bought myself a ping-pong table. Maybe I could have learned some skills and, and made one myself. But at that point in time, um, I received that ping-pong table as an extravagant gift from my father. It was, it was, it cost him, he's the one that, that planned it, that purchased it, that made it, wrapped it, right? All those, he, he went to great work, and all I did was unwrap it and enjoy it. And I did. It was fun. So, so that's what great, grace is never something that is earned or deserved. It's always a gift. Let's take a look. Turn in your Bibles to, to Micah. This is our main text today. I want to take a look at Micah chapter 6, and, um, and we'll see the word hesed here, and, and I want to, uh, to spend a little more time in Micah chapter 6. Micah is um, a short book, one of the minor prophets, um, and it's a book of God's judgment against the rebellious people. It says in, this, in 2, 3, that the people walk proudly, um, which is uh, a little hint, because they're, what they're supposed to be doing is walking humbly, but they're walking proudly, and they don't know justice. But Yahweh has a plan. First, He's going to judge them, and then He's going to rescue them. And this plan includes... A little baby that's going to be born in Bethlehem, as Micah prophesies in chapter 5 and verse 2. Um, and uh, there are several repetitions of the cycle of judgment and redemption found in this book. And one of them is found in Micah 6. Micah 6 is actually a bit of an unusual chapter because it, it describes a lawsuit. The Hebrew word is, is rib. A lawsuit, a judgment that God is bringing against his people. Um, we, God is using the imagery of the courts, and he's bringing a lawsuit. In, in, um, in chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you are to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's... Apparently, the, the hills and the mountains are the, are the jury or the judge, right? And they're going to hear this. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. And beginning in verse 3, he says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you out of the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, the king of Moab, counseled when Balaam, the son of Beor, answered. 
Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness. What, what, what Yahweh is doing is rehearsing some of the major moments in Israel's history. He's rehearsing how he rescued them from slavery, how he gave them great leaders like Moses and Aaron and Miriam, how he frustrated their enemies like, like, like uh, Balak, and how he brought them to the promised land. The mention of Gilgal there is the last stop before they entered the promised land. So he's rehearsing the great moments of their exodus and their movement into the promised land. But what did the people do? Well, they answer in, in verse 6. And to be honest, it's a little bit of a snarky answer. It's a little bit of a spoiled kind of uh, answer of the people. And, and they say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come there with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? So the people here are not portrayed very, very well. They, um, they are kind of making a mockery of what God has done and refusing to keep the... Um, the, uh, the requirements of the covenant. They are, they are thousands and thousands of sacrifices, even sacrificing our firstborn. Um, the, the, from the time of Abraham and on, the Israelite people were, were understood that child sacrifice was never right, even though the people of the ancient Near East did it frequently. And so they're, they're mocking. Should we offer child sacrifice? But, we get, but then we get to verse 6. And this is a verse you probably have, have all heard, Micah 6, 8. And here is where God describes uh, what he expects. So that people have scornfully asked what God expects them to do. And here he says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These three clauses, these three phrases are very important. And I want to take a look at them a little bit more deeply. It's interesting. Um, I, this people scornly ask God, what does he expect? Well, they know. They should know all that they're supposed to do. Um, in fact, the requirement for justice is found in the book of Amos. And the commandment to, to love and to love mercy is found in the book of Hosea. And to walk humbly before God is a major theme of the book of Isaiah. Mike is repeating the things that earlier prophets have already said. But he puts them together in this short verse that's easy to remember and that compels us to, uh, to act rightly. Let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. The three clauses of, of Micah uh, 6.8. And um, in, in when there's three clauses in Hebrew, uh, I'm going to put this all up here so you can take a look at these. Um, usually we think um, in a linear progression, at least uh, the... Classically, that's kind of the Western mindset, to think linear, to go from A to B to C, and to think linearly. But in a Hebrew mindset, it's often kind of more of a cyclical. And, the, and in fact, the middle idea is often the most interesting or most important one, the kind of the climax. There's a, a cycle here. And it's interesting that the second clause is to love mercy. And there's that word hesed, to love mercy. If you look at the two phrases together, the first two it's pretty clear that those are things that are supposed to be done towards people, to act justly towards people and to love the mercy of others. And that's why I have them in blue. And the third one is to walk humbly with your God. That's directed at God. And so we see um, two, two towards people and then the third one towards God. And it seems to me in looking at these two, to act justly and to love mercy, it has in mind human relationships that um, include uh, some kind of, maybe some kind of power dynamic. Um, maybe a, a, a boss to an employee, a parent to a child, a ruler to a subject. It might remind some of you of Confucius' five constant relationships in which the, an older sibling to the younger sibling, an older friend to the younger friend, right? Those sorts of things. And, in, in, and all of us exist in those relationships that someone maybe has, has more authority or power or maybe someone that is um, marginalized or, or in some ways. And what Micah is telling us, when you are in authority, you must act justly. You must show justice. You must act appropriately and fairly with those that are under. If you are the boss, if you are the parent, if you are the teacher, if you are the ruler, show justice to those people. 
On the other hand, when you're on the other side of the equation, when, you're, when you are the one that is under, you must love and show appreciation for the mercy that is shown to you. When people do act rightly, and they even give you more than you expect, you should love that. You should be grateful for the mercy and grace that are shown to you, particularly to those that are over you. Maybe, maybe your teacher gives you a second chance to do an assignment. Maybe your boss takes you back after you've made some mistakes. And so, so those two are towards people. And then thirdly is we're supposed to walk humbly before our God. And I think this is, is the a, a admonition to align our wills, to, to align our mind, our wills, our heart to be in submission. We are supposed to walk humbly before God. We are supposed to um, love Him. The people, right, they asked if they were supposed to do a lot of rituals, an excess amount of sacrifice and other sorts of things. That's not at all what God expects. What God really desires is that we will love Him, that we will love Him and walk humbly before Him. But let's look, there's, a little, there's something else going on here that it's important to see, right? When we look at that middle one, to show love, to show, I'm sorry, to love mercy, to love hesed, remember hesed is God's domain. And so I think that there's a sense in which that middle clause I linked it with, with justice and talk about human dynamics, but I think it also works um, with the third one to describe how we should relate to God. I think that middle term does dual service. It, 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 it informs the grace that we explain to each other, the little g grace, but it also refers to the loving, the capital G grace, the hesed of Yahweh. And in this sense, right, to love the mercy, to love the hesed of God, that should remind us of Jesus' words in Matthew 22. This is the famous passage in which Jesus was asked by the Pharisee, what is the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Right? To love God. What does it mean to love God like that? It means a total commitment. It means to, to love Him with our entire being, to worship, to, to obey, to repent, to believe and have faith. I think when Jesus says that we are to love God with our whole heart, he's telling us to believe in Jesus. And so this middle clause, I think, connects to, to God. In fact, the only way this makes sense, right, how can we walk humbly with God? We can only walk humbly with God if we have been changed. And how are we changed? We are changed when we love God's hesed. And loving God's hesed is to be saved, is to have faith in Jesus and to, and to let um, God's work change our being. And then it's not a works righteousness. It's not just an ethical system like Confucius, but it's a genuinely Christian system in which um, we are changed by the hesed of God. And that leads to the third of my uh, truths. Grace is God's domain. Grace is never earned. And God's unlimited grace results in our salvation. And our response is gratitude. <clears throat> you, you probably notice that in English, the words grace and gratitude are connected. And it shows up in some of the words. I would mentioned this earlier, right? Spanish, gracias. French, merci. Right? Gratitude and grace are connected. We're not talking here about cheap kinds of things, like when a friend treats you for dinner and you say, thanks, dude, catch you next time, right? That, you know, just a kind of flippant sort of thank you. Or when your grandmother sends you a card, thanks, Graham, you're the best. No, no, we're not talking about this kind of cheap, simple thanksgiving. But what, what God demands, right, his grace demands a gratitude that is really radical discipleship, right? It's really something deep and powerful and strong. It's all-encompassing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a, a theologian around the era of World War II who stood up to the Nazis and ultimately paid for it with his life. And he said there, is no, there should be no cheap grace, right? What, 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 what God desires from us is this strong, deep, radical, expensive grace that, that, that means that we give our whole lives, right? This is to love mercy and to walk humbly before God. Is, is, is because we are changed. Jesus says to take up your cross and follow me. That's what it means to walk humbly. 
So grace is God's best idea. It's his love that purposed at great cost to himself to fix a problem that we ourselves could never mend. Grace is never something to be earned or deserved or bought. It can only be given by the one who has the authority to those who need it the most. Grace is the radical X factor that goes beyond all of our sin. I want to conclude with one more story that I hope will inspire you and give concrete expression to the things that I've been talking about. I don't know how many of you know of this woman named Corey Ten Boom, but she's one of my heroes. Corey Ten Boom and her family, they were Dutch. They were, they were watchmakers and clockmakers, and they had a little family business um, in the uh, 1920s, 30s. And, and when, when Hitler rose to power and the Nazis began to conquer Europe and round up the Jews, the Ten Booms um, recognized that this was wrong. And uh, as, as Bible-believing Christians, they knew that, that the Jews had a special place in God's heart, and they, and they realized that, that what was happening to them was wrong. And they began to, to hide, hide Jews in their house. They actually constructed a, a secret room so the Jewish people could, for Jewish people to stay and to be kept hidden from the Nazis. And they worked to secure food and other sorts of things for the people in their care. Eventually, however, they were found out, and the Jews were arrested and sent to the concentration camps, and so were the Ten Booms. They were also judged to be guilty of crimes against the Nazis and sent to the concentration camps. And in those camps, Corey's father and her sister both died. And she, in fact, was set to be killed as well, but she was miraculously released days before her whole unit would have been uh, put to death. And, um, and after the war was ended, she felt a, um, a special place in her heart for those that had suffered, but she also realized that God was leading her to tell her story as an avenue for grace. And she began as now, a, not a young woman, she was probably in her 40s or 50s, she began a, a, a career as a, as a preacher. She traveled all over the world giving evangelistic talks, telling her story, and, um, and sharing her faith. Her, what, she wrote a number of books. Her most famous is called The Hiding Place. And if you've never read it, that's your assignment. Get a copy of that book and read it. It's a phenomenal book, and you will find it to be very moving. Um, she tells in that book that one of the hardest moments for her, as she was traveling around and starting to speak to people, she was meeting an audience and telling about God's grace and God's forgiveness and how God can turn even the horrors of the Holocaust into, into grace and love. And after the talk, people were coming up to shake her hands, and she recognized the man that came up to shake her hand. He was one of her former guards. He was a man that had abused her, that had forced her to undress, that had done terrible things. And now he came up to her at, the after, at, at one of her talks and wanted to shake her hand. He said to her, Fraulein, to think that just as you say, he has washed my sins away. And in that moment, she froze. She wrote in her book, I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. So again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, into my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for the stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that this is not, that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. He tells us to love our enemies, and he gives along with the command the love itself. This is grace, right? This is grace. It was Corey Ten Boom being able to extend little g grace to a man that had done terrible things to him because God had given his capital G grace to us. I want you to notice in Corey's life all three of the clauses, right? To do justice, she helped to hide the Jews that were being imprisoned unfairly. To love mercy, she received the unexpected grace of a miraculous release from the camp. And so she displayed that by 
using it to, to, uh, to, to be a minister and to share the gospel, and then to walk humbly, even when required to show graciousness to a man that had done terrible things, she found within herself, through the Holy Spirit, the grace to forgive him. Grace is God's supernatural gift to save us, and it is also his continual work to forgive those who have hurt us, to overcome sin, and to lead a victorious life of gratitude, of radical dis discipleship for our great God. My question for you, how are you giving out God's great gift of Hesed in your lives? What does it mean for you today to walk humbly with God? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you. Words don't seem sufficient to offer my gratitude for this tremendous grace, the chesed of Yahweh that has changed everything about my situation and our human situation. We are overwhelmed at your tremendous gift that we in no way deserved, and yet you have lovingly and lavishly bestowed it on us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow the command of Micah 6 8, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. In Jesus' name, amen.